Here's a quick math problem for you. HP Lovecraft plus John Carpenter plus Hellraiser plus Silent Hill equals... Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're discussing Jeremy Gillespie and Stephen Kostansky's Lovecraftian nightmare, The Void. Released in 2017, The Void was an instant hit amongst gore geeks. The film's insistence on creating repulsive creatures reminiscent of The Thing with nothing but practical effects earned it hardcore horror cred with those of us tired of CGI effects. You know, guys like me. The film is an Astron 6 production, and if you're not familiar with Astron 6, they're a Canadian filmmaking collective who are kind of dedicated to making 80s-style genre films. We talked a lot about making an actual horror movie. We felt like we had kind of done a lot of like tongue-in-cheek stuff. They gave us Father's Day, The Editor, and the recently released Psycho Goreman. Yeah, we'll be covering that soon. But enough about that. The real question is, is the void splattery? Let's get to the gore and find out. We fade in on a dead guy, and a door with a weird symbol on it. Must be a unisex bathroom. Then these people run out into the night screaming like banshees. This lady gets an unhealthy dose of buckshot. The lesson here? You don't have to be the fastest runner, you just gotta be faster than the slowest runner. Unfortunately for her, the buckshot didn't finish her off, so they're gonna turn her into an Alicia Keys song instead. Man, she really gives off a nice glow. You could say she's a really warm human being. They drive off, presumably to buy more smokes, and we see this weird looking guy. It's like the clan got a makeover on Queer Eye for the racist guy. Turns out he's just watching the credits like the rest of us. Hey look, it's Art Hindle. You may remember him from Cronenberg's The Brood. We'll get to that one one of these days. And here's Kenneth Welsh, who you may recognize from Romero's Survival of the Dead or the remake of The Fog. And practical effects. One of the cool things about The Void is that there are tons of great practical gore effects in this film. The beautiful thing about uh, practical effects is that they look great, um, they work best, uh, in my opinion, like uh, above CG, whatever. They look great on camera. Man, even the title is scary in this movie. With the credits over, we jump over here to your tax dollars hard at work. Deputy Dewey must have gotten demoted here after all those Woodsboro massacres. His quiet evening is interrupted when the sprinting guy from the house comes stumbling out of the woods. Damn drunks, hope he's not covered in puke. Turns out this dude's in rough shape, so it's off to the hospital. Holy shit. <laughs> Inside, they dump him on the gurney. I'm really supposed to get his insurance information first, but I guess I can make an exception. Over in this other room, Knives Chow is sharing some fascinating mortality rates with budget Scott Pilgrim. You know, statistically you're more likely to die in a hospital than anywhere else. Cool. No, really, that's Ellen Wong. Back in the waiting room, we get some foreshadowing. Dr. Paul says the baby might be on its way. Wonder if that baby's gonna be important later. Probably not, right? Foreshadowing theater is interrupted when the injured guy starts freaking out. No! I'm okay. No, no, you can't treat me. This hospital isn't in network. Do you know how much this is gonna cost me? You know how I know I'm old? When I start making jokes about health insurance. From there, it's time for more exposition as Dr. Powell delivers his plot diagnosis. Turns out Daniel and Nurse Allison are estranged because they lost a kid. As you know, Daniel, there's nothing worse than losing a child. Also, you should probably spray some shout on that stain. It'll come right out. I know from personal experience. Later, we finally get to some gore when Daniel finds this nurse performing some impromptu surgery. This isn't my face. This hospital may be shutting down, but they've still clearly got some cutting edge technology. I kind of feel like this lady took the idea of saving face way too far. Can you help me? Daniel has to put her down with extreme prejudice. No, 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 Beverly, stop! <laughs> Then we jump to these random scenes of landscapes. Hey, is this Prometheus? Back at the hospital, Dan has passed out. 
How are you feeling? Like a deck of cards, but we can deal with me later. Then Allison takes a stab at diagnosing the problem. Looks like you might have had a seizure. Oh, it's okay. I'll just shake it off, honey. He walks it off and finds state trooper Art Hindle waiting for him. I'm sorry, son, but you're parked in the ambulance lane. I'm gonna have to write you a citation. And he's got news about our strange patient in the ER. We got a major bloodbath about 20 miles north of here. Looks like he tore the place up like a butcher shop. After handing over his gun, Daniel heads off to make some phone calls. Hello, 911? I'd like to report a murder. I just killed my career. With the phones down, he heads out to his cruiser. He can't get through there either. Dispatch, this is Carter, Marsh County. Do you copy? Turns out he's got bigger problems, though. Here's that weird person in the white clan robes again. Um, shouldn't you be off screwing your sister and burning crosses somewhere? The cultist doesn't approve of that joke, and he decides to get a little stabby. Look, I'm just trying to make a point here. Poor Daniel. He's never going to get the stain out of that shirt now. And don't look now, but they're multiplying. The unisex bathroom cult demands this hospital change its archaic gender restroom practices immediately. But wait, things are getting worse, because the dead nurse is doing her best Norris impression from John Carpenter's The Thing. You gotta be fucking kidding me indeed. Daniel makes it back inside, but the place is now surrounded. Look, we're just trying to sell you some magazines to fund our youth group's trip to Jerusalem. We mean you no harm. Meanwhile, our patient is awake, and he's being menaced by whatever this is. <laughs> Looks kind of like a giant carcinoma. Art Hindle's like, I'm gonna have to biopsy you with extreme prejudice. <laughs> Man, cancer jokes. There's some real black tumor in this video. With her options being to either stay inside with Tammy Tumor or head outside with the crazy cultist, Daniel makes his choice. What the hell? What's We're leaving. Like, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, uh. But before they can put that plan in action, there's another complication. Remember the two guys from the start of the movie? Yeah, they're still in this movie. And we've got ourselves a Mexican standoff. The fuck no! Honestly, it's probably more of a Canadian standoff, really. Dr. Powell tries to play the hero. There's no reason to involve her in this. Rich, it's not gonna help you. And while he may have graduated from med school, dude clearly flunked out a hostage negotiation academy. It's probably for the best. This looks like a real cutthroat line of work. Well, they're all busy with that, Tammy Toomer nabs Art Hindle and is using his head like it's a bowling ball. This guy heads in to exit what it thinks it's doing, but it's already metastasizing. That's some pretty great gooey practical effects work. Then they start chopping into it like they're Paul Bunyan. Man, I can't even show you most of this, but take my word for it. It's amazing. They've got a real axe to grind with this thing. After the splatter, we basically learn no one really knows what's going on, but the two guys from the start of the movie have a very no one's getting out of here alive vibe. You think you, you'll stand a chance if there's another one of those things out there? Well, uh, you're not getting out of here alive vibe anyway. We're gonna die. <laughs> no, we're not gonna die. You're gonna die. And things are getting worse because pregnant girl is in labor and needs medical attention. But first, they need to take a field trip to get the shotgun out of the cruiser. Back inside, Knives is not thrilled with the situation. I should be winning Scott back from that bitch Ramona Flowers. Back outside, the cultists are waking up, which is bad news for Daniel and his new pals. Fuck's sake! Daniel has to blast this dude. Guess he was feeling triggered. They make it back inside, but Allison has wandered off to the supply room, so Daniel and his new BFF have to go find her. They're sneaking around like it's Ghost Recon. While they're skulking about, Daniel gets a call from the morgue. It's Dr. Pal. Hello, Daniel. Wait, how is he still alive? Is there a Ouija phone? Does calling from beyond the grave count as long distance? The point of this call is basically so Dr. Pal can offer his assistance. I'm going to help all of you. I mean, I took a Hippocratic Oath. It's my job to help. Before they can head down to the morgue, they need to do a little recon. Remember that patient from earlier? Yeah, he's still in this movie too. They need information and they're gonna beat it out of him, so they show him the hammer so he knows this is not a drill. He gets the message and offers up some exposition. And they did killings and sacrifices and they made us lost! 
So basically, this is like a Geraldo episode. After some more jibber-jabber, they decide to take him with them. You know what? We're gonna visit your friend in the basement. No! They head downstairs, and man, this place is a dump. I know they're shutting down this hospital, but it's clear housekeeping hasn't been down here in decades. Then things get even weirder. We're gonna go down the stairs. No, 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 no. What, no, what are you talking about? Yeah, you should go down, those. I'm sure it's totally fine. What could go wrong? I mean, besides everything. Allison, meanwhile, wakes up down in the basement with Pal. He's not gonna let death keep him from practicing surgery, though. His first patient is himself. You'd be surprised at the things you find when you go looking. And he's basically doing this because he's grieving his own dead daughter. Back in the basement, they find a door with a triangle. Great, another unisex bathroom. I don't know what we'll see in there, boys. Lock and load. Over in the operating room, Pal's doing his best to bore Allison to death with this theology lecture. You travel on, reborn into something else, like, like a caterpillar becoming a moth. And... Yeah, yeah, I get it, you're a Buddhist. Then he explains how her unborn child died. Umbilical cord became entangled, simple as that, strange, isn't it? Very lifeline between you and your child, constricting like a noose around its neck as it struggled to get out. Guessing he flunked out of the bedside manor part of med school, too. After that, he shows her his new Bobby Flay cosplay. Looks like he might have failed plastic surgery school, too. How did this guy get a medical license? While that's going on, the fellas have wandered into Pinhead's lair from the looks of things. There are lots of corpses just hanging around. They initially think it's a slaughterhouse, but then this guy realizes the truth. We're in hell. I mean, it does kind of look like Florida. And again, there's some really good gore here YouTube's not letting me show you, including a guy impaling his own head on a pole, repeatedly. Don't look now, but all these dead things are coming back to life. It's basically like the coolest Silent Hill game ever down here. Things upstairs aren't going any better. Margaret's in bad shape with that baby, and it sounds like the cultists are breaking in. That's the front entrance. Jumping back downstairs, the meth head attacks Daniel. But that's the least of his worries, because this weird thing that looks like it came straight out of Bloodborne is coming for him too. Luckily, it takes the meth head instead. Look, this film's story isn't particularly complex, but it really does have some amazing practical effects. If you love old school splatter, you're gonna want to see the void. Back upstairs, Knives needs to perform a C-section, but she's afraid she's not good enough to make the cut. Luckily, Maggie has no such qualms about slicing and dicing. And I mean that literally. Then she drops this bombshell. Dr. Powell is a great man. I'm lucky to carry his child. Man, he's old enough to be her grandfather. Talk about a May December romance. And Christ, there are a lot of puns in this video. And now the cultists are inside too. Still hopping around, we head back downstairs where the mute guy finds this picture and hallucinates his way back to this house where his partner attacks him. This is your fault! <laughs> Things look bleak until he hits the dude with a Ric Flair. Woo! He's gonna need more than Prilosec for that heartburn. Then we check in with Daniel, who's heading deeper into the building. This really does feel like Silent Hill at this point. He finds Allison on the table in the operating room, and hey, how did she get pregnant so fast? That Dr. Powell doesn't mess around. And he's here to reveal some stuff. I know your secret. I fart in bed and blame the dog. Fine, you got me. Then he sees Allison for what she's really become. Chick's like the biggest plate of calamari ever. Alright, change her back. I'm not squidding around now. When she doesn't change, he decides to put her out of her misery. You could say it's a real axe of kindness. Guessing this will save him money in the divorce too. And since Art Hindle is dead, there's no one left to arrest him. It's the perfect crime. After that, he heads downstairs, right into this Dark Side of the Moon cover art. Do you kids even remember Pink Floyd? Christ, I'm old. Anyway, now that he's here, Pal decides this is a great time for his Scooby-Doo moment. I defy God. There are things much older, older than time, and they've blessed me. <laughs> I love Craftian. While he's distracting him with all this jibber-jabber, Margaret shows up and stabs him in the back like he's Julius Caesar. Hey, too, Margaret. Wait a minute, is that Uncle Frank from Hellraiser? Because that looks like Uncle Frank from Hellraiser. Is Julia hiding down here, too? I have such sights to show you. Wait, wrong movie. And with that, he opens the portal, 
Clearly, the other dimension is just a really bright light. I thought the void was supposed to be dark and desolate. This looks warm and inviting. Then Margaret gives birth, apparently to a baby xenomorph if the chest explosion is any indication. And just when things look their bleakest, the other two guys show up with the shotgun and start putting in some work. But it's not having much effect. Haha, <laughs> look at newborn Sarah. Isn't she adorable? She's got the father down for the count, but the son is gonna go all Jim Morrison and light their fire. Hope you brought stuff for s'mores. Back in the chamber, Pal's busy gloating, so Daniel buries an axe in his shoulder. Man, there's a lot of action in this movie. Might be a record. That doesn't even slow Budget Uncle Frank down, though. Instead of dying, he offers Daniel a deal. I can give Allison to you. Oh yeah, sure. Eternity with my estranged wife. That sounds delightful. Got any better offers? With skinless Monty Hall not offering up any alternatives, Daniel gives in and takes the offer on the table. I'll take whatever's behind door number one, but you're coming with me. The gate closes, then we get another scene lifted directly from Hellraiser as the mutant chases the sun through some tight hallways. See? I wasn't kidding. They pretty much ripped that off wholesale. Oh hey, what happened to Knives anyway? Oh here she is. She lived. Is it over? Is it over? Of course it's not over. Have you never seen a horror movie before, Knives? Next, we jump over here where Daniel and Allison basically find themselves in the end of Fulci's The Beyond. Maybe they'll run into David Warbeck and catch Rona McCall wandering around here. Then they find this giant pyramid. Hold up, is this a Stargate spinoff? I knew those Stargates were bad news. And yeah, that's the void. Filmmakers wanted to leave things vague so viewers could develop their own theories about what it all means. But honestly, I'd have appreciated a more fleshed out narrative. <laughs> fleshed out. Man, the puns come even when I'm not trying. I first saw The Void back when it released in 2017. The hype was off the charts and I came away from it only mildly impressed. Yes, the FX are amazing, but the story felt like an afterthought, a sort of Frankenstein's monster of other better things like Hellraiser and Silent Hill and The Thing and a bunch of other stuff all mashed together. However, after revisiting it in 2021, removed from all the hyperbole, I like The Void a lot more. The story is still not particularly strong, but goddamn, those effects are great. I wish there were more of them, and I'd totally watch a sequel to this. But enough of that. Can the Void mutate its way to a 5 barf bag rating? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, the Void definitely delivers. I had to cut a lot of stuff to get this thing past the YouTube censors. We're treated to numerous axe murders, Cronenbergian body horror, face flaying, ritual dismemberment, and too many other things to list. The film's practical effects are uniformly excellent. In an age of CGI, they just don't make gore flicks like The Void anymore, which is too bad, because as this film demonstrates, practical effects are still fantastic. And because of that, I'm giving The Void the full-on 5 barf bag rating. This is definitely a sick flick. Looking for more interdimensional gore? Then be sure to check out my review of Hellraiser. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.